All right, I think we are going to get started. Thank you for your patience as we were troubleshooting a little technology. It's totally appropriate. <laughs> Um, I am Dave Atkins. It's my uh, privilege to get to introduce uh, Dr. Dror Benzev. Uh, Dror is a very prolific researcher, and so I will just give a few highlights here in my introductory remarks. Um, though his full CV is online, I should warn you that reading his CV is a little bit like visiting IKEA. You should <laughs> pack a lunch. Um, Dror uh, has an undergraduate degree from Ben Gurion University in Israel. Has his uh, PhD in clinical psychology from the Illinois Institute of Technology. He has had faculty appointments at IIT as well as Dartmouth where he founded the M Health for Mental Health program. And uh, we are delighted to have him uh, here with us here at UW as of February of this year. It's also my privilege to get to work with him as co-director of the Bright Center. Uh, Dror's research focuses on uh, mobile health interventions and sensing technologies uh, focused on serious and persistent mental illness. Um, and so in addition to being excellent science, it is science aimed at a vulnerable and often underserved population and one that uh, we know well here at Harvard U. So, Joror. Hi everyone. Uh, let the record show that I was wearing a jacket earlier, but because of the technical difficulties and the fast movement, I said, I'll ditch it. But as is appropriate for Grand Rounds, I, I, was, I started with a jacket on. Um, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll jump right in. Um, you know, we, we, I often start the, the talk by saying that we live in a mobile world, which of course is not going to be a surprise for the audience here. If you look in your pockets, the overwhelming majority, if not every one of you, has at the very least a mobile device, probably a pretty cutting edge and recent smartphone. And this is a very exciting time, historically speaking, because we are all alive to see the fastest adoption of technology in human history. So it takes someone to wrap our minds around that. There are more people on the planet that have access to a mobile phone than there are to a working toilet. If you can think of the healthcare implications of that, they're really astounding. And when you're thinking about, about mobile devices, some people have just the ability to call and text, but those of you with smartphones have more computational capacity sitting in your pocket than NASA had when they sent the Apollo missions to the moon. So that's just a starter to kind of help contextualize us to, to what territory we're in and the, and the potential and the opportunities that are opening up now in a way that have never been available to us before. The ability to reach people in real place and in real time and have them reach back to us for information or resources that might help them manage their health. And so when I say the fastest adopted adoption of technology in human history, let's put some numbers behind that. This is the UN's telecommunication estimates for the penetration of mobile cellular subscriptions worldwide. If you look at 2001, we see an estimate of approximately 1 billion. From there till the end of 2015, an estimated 7 billion. Now, that, of course, doesn't mean that every single person on the planet has a mobile device. Companies have multiple devices. Um, some people have more than one. What it does mean is that, by and large, the vast majority of the world's adult population has access to a mobile device in one form or another. But as a person who's interested in serious mental illness, the key question for me and before I embarked on this journey of developing interventions for, for this population that I'm invested in is do people with serious mental illness who we often know are disenfranchised have limited access to resources um, often low literacy uh, definitely low health literacy would these numbers apply to them as well right because if we don't have that penetration the idea of creating nifty interventions that will reach them becomes a little bit irrelevant and so the first thing that we did uh, back in 2011 and 12 which is which is a lifetime ago in the mobile health space, uh, we conducted a large survey. We reached out to close to 1,600 people with serious mental illness in the greater Chicago area. And by serious mental illness, I mean people with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, uh, bipolar disorder, and severe and debilitating depression, the kind of folks that get services at community mental health centers, right? the people that I'm interested in. And these were, by no stretch of the imagination, a particularly cutting edge or technologically savvy group, right? So average age was 46. Um, 
Uh, the 70% of them had a high school diploma or less. 50% of them lived independently. 50% lived in some sort of a, a supported uh, living environment. 73% um, of them earned $10,000 $10,000 or less annually, so Medicaid recipients, right? So clearly people with functional impairment. And we found that 72% of them had a mobile device. A mobile device meaning a mobile phone or a smartphone or a sidekick, which is a bi-directional texting device for people with hearing impairment. Um, most of them owned them themselves. Some people had access to a mobile device. We didn't follow up with saying, how do you have access to it if you don't own it? We don't ask questions, right? But um, in terms of the payment models, people had monthly plans, just like you and me. Um, uh, a good third of them reported also leveraging government minutes uh, or Obama uh, minutes or Obama phones. All this refers to the Federal Lifeline Assistance Program. It's a national program that is implemented at the state level with partnerships with regional carriers that allows people below a certain income level to have access to a free mobile device, and depending on the state that you're in and how it's implemented, anywhere between 200 to unlimited call and text minutes. Um, so many of them leverage this program. Again, back in 2011 and 12, right? In terms of uses, people were using their mobile devices for everything. They were talking, they were texting, they were using internet and email, and if a third of them are using internet and email, guaranteed that they have smartphones, right, that can access information online and transmit information. Um, since then, other groups have conducted uh, studies in Baltimore and in Boston, and the estimates range anywhere between 86 to 97 percent of the population now, of this population now has access to mobile phones. So the increase in penetration that we see in the general population since 2011 certainly uh, applies to, to that group. It is one of the few areas that we see uh, a minimal to non-existent gap really between people with serious mental illness and the general population in terms of access to something. And uh, recent research published in India shows that 72 to 92 percent of people with schizophrenia living there have access to a mobile phone. Um, studies conducted in four regions in the United States show that two thirds now have smartphones, people receiving outpatient services. Um, and in a study that we recently conducted with uh, Facebook users who endorse hearing voices, so people at least with psychotic symptoms, 92% of our respondents said that they had a smartphone. And again, keep in mind this is probably a younger group that we're recruiting through Facebook, but the numbers do tell a very compelling story in terms of the penetration of these devices among this population. So question number one. Answered. People with serious mental illness do in fact have access to mobile phones. They use them in a manner that is not all that different from uh, the general population. And now the doors open for, to this um, exciting potential for intervention. And so what um, my group does is focus on leveraging mobile devices, very broadly defined, to study, assess, monitor, treat, and ideally prevent mental health conditions, psychiatric illnesses. And so uh, the, our approaches have really matched the increasing sophistication of mobile devices. As the technology evolves, so does our thinking around it. Not to say that the, the, the niftier, more sophisticated approaches are necessarily better. Um, and, and I'll get to that uh, towards the end. So at its, at its basic level, we're talking about leveraging a mobile device without inventing new technology, just using it the way that it was intended to provide services. Here we have person to person, live person to another live person care. And this can be anything from a regular phone call all the way through uh, real time texting support, all the way through asynchronous texting, right? A ping ponging back and forth conversation that extends over time. And I'll provide examples for each one of these approaches in a moment. As we uh, go up that evolutionary ladder of sophistication with technology, when we have smartphones, we have the ability to host software. And so that's when we can develop apps, right? And they can be native to the device or they can be accessed online. Uh, these applications are very overt. It's very clear that you're engaged in some form of assessment and intervention. Uh, they're algorithm driven usually and automated so it'll start by asking questions and then based on your response it'll take you down a certain choose your own adventure route and i'll again provide examples for some things tools that we've developed for people with smi 
And now we're really um, immersing ourselves in this new frontier, right? Now we have the capacity to leverage things like sensors, whether they're wearable sensors or sensors that are embedded in your smartphones. You have a host of sensors that uh, enable you to do all the things that you do with a smartphone. We try to repurpose those sensors to find indicators of deteriorating health or need for care. Um, once you detect a signal, whether it's by eyeballing the data or whether it's through some sort of machine learning uh, potential, you can act, hopefully, based on, behavior, on objective behavioral data. And that approach becomes much more invisible. We're collecting the data from the device really without requiring much from the user aside from installing it on their phone and giving us the authorization, partnering with us to help improve their health. Okay, so let's go back to that first rung on the evolutionary ladder. The first approach is a model, and this is, of course, one of many approaches that people have for texting, for clinical texting, but the model that we developed is called a mobile interventionist. And the idea is that there is a community-based case manager who is texting with people with serious mental illness and co-occurring substance use. So folks who are uh, very well known for disengaging from services and requiring intensive, and, and in some cases, acute care. And just a quick overview of how this works, it'll start by our person, our mobile interventionist, Sarah, will visit patients at home. If they have a mobile device, well, they'll do some ping pong exchanges right then and there in their home, mimicking how this might look. If not, then the first step is connecting them with the things that they're eligible for. So if they do meet that criteria for the Federal Lifeline Assistance Program, we'll try to link them with the resource, get them a device, get them a data plan, and then have that home visit uh, again and, and get up and running with an intervention. Once Sarah and patients decide on the most viable treatment targets, whether it's a um, housing crisis or focusing more often focusing on symptom management, they will, uh, they'll start a ping-ponging back and forth conversation that starts the next day. And the entire thing from that point on is done remotely. So the first visit helps attach a friendly face to the interventionist, but beyond that, really, we don't have face-to-face -face interactions at all with Sarah. Um, usually, it'll be three text exchanges per day that involve some sort of assessment and response to the content that people respond with. Uh, the next day, if people don't have real major cognitive impairment, they'll pick up the conversation where it ended the night before. So texting ends at 5 p.m., and people are aware of this. At the end of the week, Sarah will also send a summary email to those individuals' clinical teams. So the team leaders, at the very least, know about the things that these individuals have reported over the course of the week. The idea is that this new information might help them provide more targeted care, right? So they might have access to information that the clinical team might not otherwise have. So how does something like this actually look? A morning text might start with something like, Hi, it's Sarah. How are you feeling, Ray? And Ray might respond. If Ray responds, he might respond, Hi, Sarah. Voice is talking about me. So clearly this person is referencing their auditory hallucinations, right? And ideally, he, Ray and Sarah brought this up during that first meeting, so she knows to expect that there are some psychotic symptoms here. She'll respond with, That's stressful. You're not alone. Lots of people hear voices. So first jab is normalizing, right? Um, Ray responds saying, they say, they're saying something bad will happen to me if I take the bus. Um, so here, we're bringing something that, that is very tailored and contextual, contextually driven, right? And hopefully, Sarah picks up on this and is able to respond and says something like, but voices make mistakes all the time. I have a trick that can help you test the voices. You can even use it on the bus. So the idea is I'm going to give you something that you can take with the mobile device to wherever you go. Want to hear about it? And if Ray responds, well, Ray responded with maybe, um, what is it? That's the window of opportunity that we're looking for, right? We want to create this openness and willingness because now Sarah can start punching in with illness management techniques, whether they're cognitive behavioral, whether they're behavioral, whether it's basic relaxation strategies or cognitive restructuring or dysfunctional beliefs associated with voices, depending on what the person presents. Uh, Sarah and I was working as her supervisor for this. We were challenged with thinking of very pithy, quick responses to whatever people bring up. 
And so we conducted a 12 week trial and we recruited people with psychotic disorders and substance use. And again, average age 40, um, people at baseline had moderate cognitive impairment, moderate psychotic symptoms and moderate depression. So again, uh, a pretty representative group. 80% uh, of them were hospitalized at least six or more times in the past, so definitely people that often are in crisis. 47% of them reported experience with texting, which means that more than half of them have, had never texted before. So we provided some basic training on even how to use the, the, those uh, buttons on their phone as part of that first visit. And so at the end of the trial, in terms of feasibility, for starters, we had zero dropout. So, what? <laughs> what? so every single person that started the intervention finished it, right? So that on its own is uh, eye-opening if, if we're skeptical about the willingness and capacity of these folks to engage. On average, they received about 140 text messages that they needed to respond to. Across participants, the response rate was 87%. When we at we, that was per person, <clears throat> yes, satisfaction ratings. We administered a measure of satisfaction at the end. Uh, the majority thought that it was easy to use, that they would recommend it to a friend. They thought that it was useful, helped them be more effective and productive, helped them be in control of their activities in their life. And in terms of clinical outcomes, uh, two people reported suicidal ideation to Sarah, and they were stabilized through an interaction between them and their clinical team that was, that was brought to their attention in the background. One person reported not having medications, not sleeping, not eating, a pattern that was uh, usually the indicator of heading towards the hospital for this individual or, or potentially worse. Uh, she was stabilized as well, and when we looked at, and this was a single arm trial, so when we looked at pre-post reduction in psychotic symptoms and as measured by the PANS, the positive and negative syndrome scale, and uh, depressive symptoms measured by the BDI2, we found meaningful and significant changes within, within ARM. Now, recently, we were awarded a grant from NIMH to test a, a fully powered RCT to see where, where this leads, but, but definitely exciting outcomes. The, the, I suppose the worry that we had going in was, can we even create a therapeutic relationship entirely mediated through text. We, we, we'd never done this before. Um, and so we also administered a working alliance inventory that will tell us something about how people rate the quality of the relationship, whether they and Sarah were able to agree on the same targets, uh, things like, I believe my clinician likes me, would Sarah be able to co convey this through text? And so we administered the WAI, the Working Alliance Inventory, and we asked people to give two responses. One, to rate their in-person clinicians, <laughs> brace yourselves, and uh, on the other side, to rate their mobile interventionist. And we found that ratings for both of them were quite high. The ratings for the mobile interventionist was significantly higher. So clearly, Sarah was able to establish a relationship through text. Okay, moving on to that next rung up the evolutionary ladder. We're, we're, that's where we're, we're diving into <laughs> smartphones. And so I'll tell you a little bit about Focus, which is um, an app. It's really a smartphone system. It involves multiple elements, not just an app. But, um, it's a, it's a, an intervention that we developed for people with serious mental illness. And it's been funded through NIH and several other grants that uh, really allowed us to develop and test and improve and refine and then deploy large-scale implementation and then test with with a randomized control trial so we've been very fortunate to benefit from from grants that, that supported focus um, at the first step we really used a user-centered design to identify what the needs are of people with schizophrenia we, we spoke to, to we surveyed 904 people with a psychotic disorder we also met with practitioners who were working at cmhc's to see what the targets are that they believe are um, just not moving with face-to-face -face care what could they use support in addition to what could we possibly target with a mobile self-deployed intervention uh, we also spoke to a, to a few CEOs who were based in Chicago to see how might this intersect with their strategic objectives, uh, state funding, things kind of bigger picture ideas. Then we assembled a multidisciplinary team comprised of clinical psychologists, me and a few others, uh, technology specialists or programmers who help us put it together, uh, content development, we drew content from other 
evidence-based interventions, anything from, again, a lot of it is CBT for psychosis because that's my personal background and training, but a little bit of motivational interviewing, a little bit of anger management, a little bit of um, sleep hygiene, because the five targets that were identified during these early stage interviews were coping with voices, not a surprise there, uh, med management, uh, mood, which really means depression and anxiety, sleep, and uh, what was med voice? Oh, and social functioning, right? Because people kept bringing up this idea that they are, they cannot, oftentimes can be very socially isolated. Um, the med management piece was something that the clinicians brought up more than the patients. Sleep was something that, well, it's not a core symptom of schizophrenia, of course, but it's very common that people, when people are feeling worse off and have sleep disturbances, uh, this was completely derived from patients, right? Where they, the, the, this idea of sleep kept coming up and up again. And so we thought, well, we've got to do something about it because a lot of people are describing it. And so we had several cycles of usability testing. And uh, based on the feedback, we did lab-based usability. People responded both to the content and the look and the feel. We uh, evolved and adapted the devices that were, that were storing this until we eventually at the end there arrived at the current version of Focus, um, deployed it into the field, got more feedback, refined, deployed it again. And once we felt that we were ready to go with something that was worth trying, uh, we did just that. And so uh, to give you a little bit of a description of how focus works, uh, there, it's a combination of prompted interactions with the system, meaning we will pre-program it to prompt you in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. The clinician or the end health specialist that is assigned to the patient and the patient will decide which of these five treatment areas is most relevant to them. So if people don't have voices, they won't get a prompt for voices. If people only have voices, they might get prompted to, to focus on assessment and intervention of voices up to three times a day. In addition to that, though, they can also access all the focus intervention 24-7. It's installed. It's a native application. So once it's installed on your device, they can pop into the toolkit and launch whatever it is that they want. <clears throat> And the way that this works is assuming that they're walking around and, and, and focus prompts them, it'll take over their home screen and it will ask, can you check in with focus right now? The individual says yes, it'll follow up with an assessment question. Have you been bothered by voices today? Right? This person was assigned voices for the afternoon. And so if they say anything but not at all, that gives us intervention territory. Right? And so this individual says moderately, and so we follow up with an assessment of the dysfunctional beliefs that they might have about voices. So in CBT for psychosis, unlike in other disorders, we will often target the beliefs that people have about the symptom rather than, often in the case in depression, you'll actually target the, the, the cognitions or the symptom, right? And here, the assumption behind CBT is that we may not change the frequency of voices, of perhaps these biologically driven experiences, but we can certainly affect the distress and impairment that symptoms have on people's lives and their sense of how debilitating they need to be. And so here we offer some of the common dysfunctional beliefs that people have about voices. They're uncontrollable, they're all-knowing, they're powerful, they're unpleasant, or something else. And again, depending on what the person endorses here, we'll go down a different route. And so here the user says, I think they're all-knowing. And so focus will respond with a sequence of quick and dirty interventions. Voices may sound like they know everything, but they don't. Sounds a lot like Sarah, right? It's the same, same bozo who wrote both interventions, right? So, um, so voices may sound like they know everything, but they don't. Can you think of any time when the voices made a mistake? How about when the voices were sure something was going to happen, but it didn't? So here we're starting to give people some tools to check. I know that, this, that there's, a, there's a lot of emotionality around this experience of, of, of voices, but is there any sort of evidence that, from the past that might show that they're not always right? And then if the voices got it wrong once, they probably don't know everything, right? Think about it. And so the idea is something very quick and pithy, but it happens multiple times a day, multiple days. So it's a, it's a low intensity, but very, very high frequency intervention. And the idea is that 
ultimately people adopt some of these strategies and they don't become dependent on focus, but rather it's integrated into their own repertoire. They start deploying some of these self-questioning approaches themselves. And so beyond the user facing, the patient facing side of this, there's also a clinician or clinical researcher dashboard. So we, once they, people have, are connected to the internet, the focus system will upload the data to a remote secure server where it's processed and quickly made available to us looking in the background. So we can log on to a, an individual and look at their responses. If you look at the top, we can see their response rate usually summarized over the last week or so. So we see whether people have been responding or not. That on its own is an indicator of how engaged and sometimes how well they're doing or not. We see the three treatment targets that are assigned to them, sleep, mood, and medication. And we see the severity of their responses to those assessment questions. So a breakdown of the percentages of when they say they have severe voices or severe difficulty in sleeping and when they seem to be doing just fine. At the bottom there, there's actually a log that, that the user can scroll down and see all their entries throughout a focus deployment. So a motivated individual can see how they've been responding over the last three months or more. And so um, we, we first deployed it as part of a 30-day trial. Uh, I won't bore you with the details of saying that this sample, the sample that we deployed this was representative. They weren't especially young or technologically savvy. And um, uh, in, during those 30 days, participants used focus on 86% of the days that they had the device. On average, during the first week, they used it 6.4 times a day. In the last week of the deployment, they used it 4.9 times a day. Now, if you remember, focus only prompts you three times. So in, in both case, in, in, in the first week and even in the last week, people elected to use it above and beyond what we prescribed, whatever that means. And so when we looked deeper into the data, we found that 62% that of, of their use was on-demand use. And we weren't incentivizing people to log on. So there was no uh, monetary advantage for someone to go into focus. If they didn't find it helpful, they just didn't use it. They were paid for assessments, right? So, they're, so technically, they could have not used it at all. Um, we administered a usability and feasibility measure at the end, which is common for tech development and, and, and is part of the, this user-centered design. Uh, overall, people were very, very satisfied with focus. So uh, they, they would recommend it to a friend. They didn't find it very complicated. They thought it was easy to use. If they had it, that they would, they would use it. They felt confident using it. They didn't need to learn a lot of things before getting, to, getting going with it. So this was very reassuring for us. It, it really helped us feel good about that user-centered and, and extended development period, right? That we know that we actually, it seems like we were able to develop something that is very, very accessible to our target population. But we also, of course, checked pre-post changes in some of their, of their symptoms, right? And we, we found, we didn't find a significant change in sleep or in their beliefs about medication use, but we did find significant changes in psychosis, again, measured using the pants, and in depression. Now, if you look at these average changes, these are comparable to what you get from clinic-based individual psychosocial interventions for people with SMI, if not better. And so we were able to accomplish that using this remote intervention. And again, an individual that calls on a weekly basis called the M Health Specialist for a 10-minute check-in to help do technical troubleshooting, but also help talk through how you might use some of the social, the, the training skills, the illness management skills in your day-to-day -day life. So it's not just an academic experience. You're not didactically learning about something but not using it. So, so that's part of that 10-minute conversation. In, in a follow-up study, we uh, were able to attach focus to a relapse prevention program that was funded through the Center for Medica Medicaid and Medicare Innovation, uh, deployed in several states. It was, um, it was really encouraging to see that the overwhelming majority of the people that were involved, one, elected to use Focus and the smartphone as part of the Relapse Prevention Program. And um, this was a high-risk group. These were all people who were recruited within 60, 60 days of being discharged from a hospitalization. So uh, the fact that we were able to do that with people who were less stable than our typical samples also said something. In terms of use, we found, interestingly enough, that the patterns, that some of the demographic variables that predict who does well in face-to-face -face care played out and who did more with focus as well. 
So females, on average, use focus more than males, 0.4 more days a week. White participants used it on average more than African-American participants, 0.7 more days a week. And older participants, 30 or older, used it on average more than younger. This is identical to what you see in uh, the literature talking about psychosocial interventions for, for people with SMI. Interesting. Uh, if you look at the red line, the red line represents, so we have the types of mHealth use, the focus use, whether it's responding to prompts or um, initiating on-demand resources. So the red line represents a subsample of about 44% of this group who actually used focus in one form or another for five months or more. So even though you see some decline in how they're using it over time, it's not major. And even if we're looking at something like uh, daily on-demand use, right, so electing to use it regularly, even in week 24, we still see at that bottom right, we still see that people, that that group of 44% of was electing to do this about twice a day. So it's engaging, it's feasible, it's accessible. We took it a step further. We said, well, you know, part of our pitch for why these interventions are needed is because we're saying people might ha not have access to care. They might have neurocognitive impairment, low literacy, low health literacy. A lot of it is written, right? And so what if people struggle with these written interventions? Are, are they going to continue to read content over three, four, five months. And so we developed uh, what we're calling Focus AV, the audio video version of it. It's a parallel version that people can elect to use, to read either the written content or watch video or hear audio for every single one of the Focus interventions, which are at about 160 or so. So last study in this Focus uh, line of research, before I, I bolt into sensing, is uh, a comparative effectiveness trial that we just completed, a three-year study where we compared focus to wellness recovery action planning. It's a clinic-based group intervention that has two facilitators with lived experience, and the idea here is to see, can we, can we accomplish the same thing with a smartphone and mHealth specialist person who is based remotely to what we can accomplish with clinic-based care? Um, that actually has uh, a few RCTs supporting its evidence. So it's, so it's an evidence-based intervention for people with serious mental illness. And um, overall, we found no significant difference in the clinical outcomes or satisfaction ratings between these two conditions. So essentially, focus over the three-month trial, and we did 10 cycles of these extended over three years, essentially both of them produced the same outcomes. And when, when then we said, well, let's look at some changes within group here to see what we actually got and what might be the characteristics. And we're still, we actually just completed this very, very recently. So we're, we're going to do, we're going to stratify and look at diagnostic groups. But here, these are the complete samples of people with SMI. So it's about 50% of each, of each group are people with schizophrenia, but we also have people with bipolar disorder and depression, and we look, need to look at differences within group. Um, but when it comes to focus, if you see there's a pre-post difference, um, on SCL9. SCL is the symptom checklist 9. It's a short version of the SCL90, for those of you who are familiar with it. It's a general measure of psychopathology. Uh, and that difference was similar to what we saw in RAP. And when we look at the BDI2, we saw, again, uh, small, small with an eye towards medium uh, Cohen's D there, both in focus and in clinic care in, in the RAP we did see um, a very small improvement in recovery, uh, uh, recovery assessment scale, so this general, general sense of recovery and advantage to, to RAP. Uh, in fact, that's one of the core targets of RAP, is recovery is in the, in the name. But by and large, the take-home message here is when we're thinking about comparative effectiveness, whatever we're accomplishing with what is considered uh, an evidence-based intervention for SMI can also be accomplished with mobile health. Okay, here comes the bolting part. So, um, so the last rung up there is the sensing and, uh, and signal detection. And here we're using a system called CrossCheck. It really takes everything from your phone. We're, we're deploying self-reports, asking people what their symptoms and functioning has been like. We're looking at their app use, 
we're looking at the calls, call frequency. We're not actually looking, recording the spoken word, but we're looking at incoming calls and outgoing calls. We're looking at SMS and texting activity, but we're also leveraging all the sensors that are embedded in the device. And so we're looking at GPS for geospatial activity. We spark up the microphone to collect ambient sound. We use light sensors and accelerometers that are embedded in your device. And this is where the title for the talk comes in, my smartphone can do what? Um, you'll, you'll learn in a moment. All that data is collected. We run classifications on the device on the fly. It's uploaded to secure remote servers. It's processed and we're looking in the background. And when we see something that, is, that we think is clinically meaningful, we act on it. How does this work? Um, well, first of all, the st structure of the study, it's a, it's a four year R01, which is also coming to an end now. Uh, at the first phase, we just spent a year developing the system and making sure that what we say we're sensing, we're actually sensing. At the end of the year, we were doing a pretty good job. It's still not bulletproof, but, but we uh, certainly enhanced it. We did some usability and feasibility trials, both with outpatients and in inpatient settings. And then we did a, a randomized control trial. We, we recruited 150 people with schizophrenia who were discharged within the last year from, hosp from a hospital, uh, split them into two arms. One group gets cross-check for this remote monitoring over the course of a year. And the other group gets treatment as usual at our partner hospital, Zucker Hill site in, in Long Island. And the objectives of the intervention were increased to increase the time to relapse and the number of relapses overall. And so GPS gives us an indication, you use it to navigate, right? It gives us, we rejigger things and, and create a, an indicator of the distance that an individual covers during the day. And we also calculate the time that they spent at a particular location. So we don't, actually look at your coordinates um, to protect patient privacy, but we can't, we do break it down into primary, tertiary, uh, secondary and tertiary locations, and we look at the proportion of time that you spend in each. What we're hunting for are changes, right? Changes within individual. So in an outpatient setting, that's done with GPS. When we did it in an inpatient setting, we took an inpatient psychiatric unit in New Hampshire and placed Bluetooth beacons in every single room on the unit, and so when people were responding to self-report, there was also an automatic ping from the Bluetooth beacons. And so depending on your signal strength, we could tell exactly where you were on the unit when you were saying something relevant. And so um, it was a way for us to check, check whether the context um, was at all related to the occurrence of violent ideation and behavior and people were hospitalized. Kinesthetic activity, we use the accelerometers that help orient the, the display on your screen. Well, we use it to determine whether someone is walking or running or cycling. We use Google API to, to determine that. But really the thing that we pay attention most to is whether you're active or not. You know, the proportion of sedentary time during the day, which we know is often a strong indicator whether someone is doing well or not. We'll spark up the microphone every two minutes. We have software that looks for human speech in your immediate environment, anywhere between six to 10 feet of you. If it picks up on that conversation, it will classify it as an occurring conversation. So we can look at conversation frequency. We can also look at conversation duration, perhaps as a proxy of you spending time in a social environment. We can't determine whether the, the individual who's carrying the device is actually engaged in that conversation. What we can determine is that they're around other people speaking. Okay. Um, and finally, we use combinations of sensors like device, their, their lock time, ambient light, ambient sound, and movement to try to create a model of sleep, sleep duration. And in some of our early testing, we're within 35 to 40 minutes of self-reported sleep duration at night. And again, you don't need to have the phone in bed with you measuring your movement. It's all this is done on the fly so long as the device is in the room with you. So how does this look? How does data from a year of data collection like this look? Well, I'm gonna provide three examples, very quick examples. The black dots represent self-report. These are the days, uh, uh, the X is days in the study. So remember, it's a year of data collection. Y is, there, is the composite score for self-report. Higher scores are, are better, lower scores are poor functioning. And so here you see that the individual was not responding for a while but then the, we encourage them to start answering their self-reports, which are delivered every three days. And for a while, they're hovering in this area of zero to five, right? So they're, they're overall, they're doing well. If you look at around day 225, 230, there's a dip in their composite score. 
that blue line represents a psychiatric hospitalization that they had. And so that dip, that self-reported uh, symptom exacerbation occurred right before their psychiatric hospitalization. They were gone for about a week or so. When they were discharged, look what happens gradually with their self-report. It starts climbing back up and they return to the points that they were before. And so in this case, we didn't need a lot of fat, fancy sensing. In this case, it, this individual had good insight and reported on their symptoms. Um, but in the second case, the self-report doesn't really win the day here. This person was flat. They weren't re reporting any changes. But if you look at their geospatial activity, the hours that they spent at, the, at, the, at a primary location, blue line again represents a hospitalization, something happens at day around 210, right? They stop spending time at all in their primary location. Now, this is something that we never would have picked up on from the self-report and the clinicians didn't know about, but clearly we have objective indicators that this person, we don't know where they're going, we know that they're not at home anymore. So whether it's a housing, housing crisis or they moved, something was going on in their life. And again, blue line hospitalization. And the last one, uh, the last case, these are different people, uh, we looked at device activity between midnight and 6 a.m. for this individual. Right? So device activity means going online, using apps. Uh, these are the hours. So, so, you know, there's some nights up until around day 140. There are some nights where they're a little bit more active, but overall they're sleeping most of those hours. But right around that mark, they're clearly, we don't know what they're looking at online and we don't know who they're texting or, or, or interacting with, but we know that certainly they're not asleep. Right? because their device is giving us all these signals that this person is undoubtedly up. And then that happens for several weeks and that person is hospitalized for a good chunk of time. When they're discharged, look what happens to their nighttime activity. Interesting. So the take home message from all this is that we're looking for signals within individual that there's probably not gonna be a sign that cuts across all, all patients. And so we need to start hunting for what we're thinking of as a unique relapse signature. We can look at what we think of as meaningful events and circle back from that mark, right? A meaningful event meaning a, a hospitalization, suicide attempt. When we find their unique pattern of sensor data, we try to isolate that and moving forward, we start hunting for that. We start looking for the pattern that was an indication of exacerbation for that individual. And the next time around when we find it, this is the aspirational piece, uh, we're not just observing, we reach out. Right? The red flag is raised and reaching out means it's a combination of both uh, feedback directly to the individual that if they haven't been in care for a while, now would be a good time to do this. What is their medication status? Do they need some support? We also get in touch with the clinical team based at the hospital and say, has John been in lately? John is the name of my co-investigator at Zucker Hillside, so it's not a patient. I'm not disclosing anything. Um, the idea here is to trigger time-sensitive wraparound care to try to prevent this person winding up in the hospital again. Okay. Um, I will skip where we're heading, um, although I think we're really just touching the tip of the iceberg now. The idea here is not just to think of this as a, as a stepped escalation in sophistication, but rather start thinking about combinations of approaches, right? Live clinical, clinical interventionists when possible, passive sensing, self-management, all this can be integrated into one unifying platform, right? So people might have some sort of stepped care model where they increase the intensity of services and live intervention as needed. Um, and I'll just end with one uh, quick note that uh, for some of you, this may sound exciting, but some of you might think about this and, and get freaked out a little bit, right? We're sort of collecting your data, we're doing all these things. Uh, one, all of this is voluntary, right? We're not the NSA. We don't collect data without people knowing. This is a partnership that we have with patients, and they want and elect to engage in this. And keep in mind, I'm not an engineer. I'm a clinical psychologist. I was brought to this field because I believe in the healing power of human connection. But time and time and time again, we see all these indicators that people want to use digital resources. There's research showing that people with SMI are using um, platforms like YouTube as methods of self-care. They're posting testimonials about illness and using the comment section as a method of creating a virtual community for themselves. 
So surely people are voting with their feet, right? Our patients are interested in getting these services, and I think it's, it's on us to make sure that they get high quality care. All right, folks, thanks very much for your attention. I appreciate it. I know it was a, it was a fast run, um, and I'm happy to answer if people want to stick around. I'm happy to answer a few questions, but I won't be insulted if you leave. Um, thanks very much. Yeah. How does that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I get that question every time. Does this, this idea of your, and I can say a couple of things. One, we've had studies where we specifically recruited people with persecutory ideation. We were studying, because I was interested in paranoia, we were studying persecutory ideation. And um, regarding the participants that volunteer to participate, which again might be a self selecting group, right? It's very rare that we have any sort of dropout or concern uh, along, along those lines. Now, granted, this is, not, this is not business as usual. It's not clinic-based care where we give this to people um, whether they want to or not. They elected to volunteer for a study, and so there might be a subsample of folks that will never want this, right? And they never call us, and they never get engaged. But from the folks across studies, the folks who participate, um, it is exceedingly rare that we will have anyone report any sort of atrogenic effect or any integration of that into persecutory ideation. Once in a while, we'll have someone who will adopt a unique behavior. So we had a participant who used to use the, the device on airplane mode, right? And so they thought that for whatever reason, they would only respond to it in airplane mode. Now, of course, if we had some sort of nefarious intention, airplane mode would not protect anyone, right? We can create an illusion of not monitoring, but that's not what we're doing. Right, so, so you'll get these sort of idiosyncratic behaviors, but by and large, not a major barrier at all. So if they understood the purpose of the tracking. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely, they understood, and oftentimes when we call, when we do think that we're getting a sort of a soft signal of someone struggling and we'll call, they will usually thank us. They'll say, it's rare that we have false positives. If anything, I think that there are things that, we're, that we miss sometimes, but people will say, thanks for checking in. I've, I have had this, that, or the other. Uh, we have not had many cases at all uh, in any of these approaches where people will be freaked out by it. Other questions? I know it's late. Guys, thanks very much for your attention. I appreciate it. And have a great holiday weekend. Thanks, Amanda.